the reason I left ELO was through pressure from Don Arden, not because, I mean, some of the uh, the media said that me and Jeff had had an argument. Or we, I, for, from, from now till then, I don't think Jeff had ever, uh, and I had ever fallen out. Uh, but it's, it's how Arden and his, uh, his team wanted to portray it, mm-hmm. that we'd fallen out. So, you know, now two bands is something and I didn't realise until years later that he, Arden was trying to split us up because he knew that we were both decent songwriters and he could earn more, more money if we were in separate bands. Think about it mm. from a managerial point of view. So the, the earliest uh, memory I have of this is we, Arden never, he never came to gigs and we were, uh, we were in uh, ELO. Uh, we were doing a tour of the, uh, we're over in Italy of all places. And then all of a sudden, Arden turned up with his son and a, a few people from the office. And I thought, what the hell is he doing here? Because he never, ever comes to gigs. He never came to any move gigs. Never. And I wondered, what uh, there's something going on here. So anyway, I mean, in, in those days, my, my hearing was good in those days. I could have got a job on a submarine, you know what I mean? I think it means very good at hearing. And Great line. We were walking down the street. We, we, we were walking down the streets in Italy from from the sand check, I think, to the hotel or something. And it was me, me and Arden side by side walking. He was chatting to me, and I was listening to what was going on behind. Jeff was behind me with a couple of people uh, from the office. Then they were chatting, and they were spreading the – shit like you wouldn't believe saying oh you know Roy wants all the publicity and this that and the other which is totally the opposite of what it was you know you know planting audible stuff into Jeff's mind if you know what I mean and uh, in those days I mean we were we were both only like early 20s you know we never thought that somebody would have a plan like this you wouldn't have but we didn't that mm-hmm. and uh, anyway uh, after the tour things started to get a bit squiffy if you know what I mean and um, but uh, rather than letting us have some time to write and uh, and uh, leave things for a while, he put us straight in the studio. I went in there and I'd, uh, uh, how can I explain this? I, I went in there and I'd, I just had my, uh, my uh, Fender jazz bass turned into a fretless. So I was really keen on playing it, like whizzing about on it and everything. And I thought, oh, that, I'll try it on really this That's really early. That's, hang on, that's really early. That's what, 70, yeah. 71 we're talking. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. You're, you're, you're a pioneer there, Roy. <laughs> so I was playing stuff like Pino Palladino plays now, if you know what I mean. Not as good, Influenced but that by the kind cello. of sound. Wow. That, that sort of sound. I did it on this track. That, uh, in fact, it was a track that Jeff had written. And, uh, and uh, Jeff was being slightly grumpy about it. He says, oh, oh I don't like that. Yeah, that kind of thing. But I ended up putting the fretless space in the back in the case, and I walked out of the session, and I went to meet a Mason Wayne, uh, Rick Price, who was who was the bass player in uh, the Move uh, at the end of the Move, and he was the bass player in Wizard as well. Uh, good bloke, and it, I just wanted somebody else's opinion who knows stuff, and uh, he was recording at Air Studios with a with, with a band there. And we, we're chatting about it all, and, and it, I came to the conclusion that it would be a, the best idea to leave ELO before we actually fell out, which we never did fall out, and that's what I did.